Uh, we're a little bit late, but that's okay. It's wonderful to have uh, the audience here that we've got. Uh, my name is Dan Kittredge. Most of you, I think, probably know me. Um, this is the, uh, we've enticed you all here with the threat of a handheld spectrometer um, to <laughs> use to uh, raise awareness about, about food quality and this broader, um, this broader movement. Um, my, my job here today is to, is to frame uh, where we're at uh, broadly, um, just to run through the agenda for what to expect uh, during the day today. Uh, I'm going to do that for about half an hour, sort of stand back and sort of just, you know, sort of look at the big picture and, and, and convey some basic points. Um, we're going to pr proceed on with the Pharma West team, uh, Dorn Cox and Mike Stenta, who are going to talk about the open data platform. Um, the partners that we've got on board for all of that uh, will have a short uh, coffee break. Uh, and then uh, Greg uh, Ostick, the developer of the tool, uh, will come and speak about that um, where that's come from, where it's at right now, where we're going forward. Um, David Forster uh, will talk about the definition of quality, where we're at with the data collection, and all of the sort of details of what is quality in the process. Um, we'll break for lunch at that point around noon. Um, hopefully, people will have had a lot of, um, you know, sort of a deep dive download on, on where things stand currently. Uh, we'll try to have time for questions after each of the presentations in this morning. Um, uh, then I want to uh, open the, the floor for people to come up and uh, give two, three, max five minute um, um, comments. Um, you will, if you haven't already been um, invited to speak, you will be. Um, not, we don't have time for everyone, but there's a number of people here who, whose wisdom, perspective, experience is, is uh, quite impressive. And I'd like to sort of give them a chance to, to comment and um, really sort of, you know, give feedback, critique, suggestions, sort of open, open this uh, idea to the broader movement. Our, our objective here, as you'll hear me say uh, soon, is really to, to f you know, facilitate broad and deep collaboration. Um, so after that sort of hour after lunch, we'll break out into smaller groups um, on sort of smaller topic areas. We've got a number of uh, breakout rooms around the corner, um, give people an hour or so to have everybody here uh, get a chance to sort of convey your thoughts, get them captured. Um, we'll have a sh I think the break is after that, and then we'll come back and conclude um, by five. So um, that roughly is in your uh, program book. I'm guessing people have that, but it's always good to have it verbally conveyed as well. Um, so that all being said, I think I'd like to sort of just um, really, really go into what we're what we're intending here. Um, um, I'll try not to say too much of what I'm going to say tomorrow night at the keynote. Although I think some of the points are are, are relevant. Um, <clears throat> uh, most people here know me, and not everyone does. Uh, just a quick background about myself: um, I'm the uh, executive director of the Bionutrient Food Association. Um, I have a background uh, growing up on an organic farm. Um, really, sort of. Uh, you know, part of, I would say, the organic movement for the past 30-plus uh, years at this point. Um, uh, came to this work as a farmer um, when I became aware of um, the need to do a better job uh, farming, um, when I understood that I, my economic viability as a farmer had to do with the health of the plants that I was working with and foundationally the health of the life in the soil and the way the soil was taken care of. Um, and so the Bionutrient Food Association is an organization that has been uh, focused on increasing quality in the food supply, um, as in nutritional value, flavor, aroma, um, because we understand that it correlates directly with the health of the plants, the health of the soil, the health of the ecosystem, um, carbon sequestration, um, the nu nutritional value of food, um, the health of the humans that eat the food. Um, we actually believe that our cultural health, our consciousness, our ability to uh, engage deeply um, as sentient beings um, has a lot to do with what we eat. Um, and so we see this, um, this leverage point, this sort of high ground strategically um, in a broad movement um, of, that's sort of really beautifully evolving now um, and growing. And we see that, that, high, that high ground that pretty much we can't find anybody to dis disagree with. Um, that 
increasing quality in your food is a beneficial thing. Nutritional value, that's, a, that's something that we should be, um, that we can agree upon broadly and work together uh, towards. Um, my experience in my 20s, uh, you know, as an activist in, in various realms uh, was that there was oftentimes things to fight against. Um, you know, the anti-GMO campaign, you know, globally I was part of, uh, political work, presidential political politics. I'm sure many people here in this room have been engaged in fights um, about <laughs> various things, and um, we all, you know, truly felt they were legitimate fights. Um, um, and, you know, I think part of what we're trying to bring forth is an idea that rather than fight what we don't want, we should build towards what we do want. And we should come together around what it is that we want to see. Um, and so foundationally, that's what we're trying to bring forth here. Um, and that's the conversation we're trying to um, you know, hold space for. Uh, so the structure, the strategy, the vision behind this campaign, um, you know, we use the tool, the handheld spectrometer, as a hook to sort of capture people's attention. Um, you know, shiny objects. You know about how shiny objects work? People like <laughs> shiny objects, little gizmos and things like that. Not everybody does, but in general, you can catch people's attention with that. Um, you know, that's, that's the hook. But really, strategically, we're up to something much um, broader and much more systemic. So um, what we want to do here today is lay that out, lay out the agenda, lay out the pieces of the puzzle, lay out the strategy, um, you know, convey that thoughtfully and deeply to the audience here uh, in attendance, to the audience watching online. Um, this is going to be recorded. This is going to be available for people, um, you know, globally to to experience and perceive. Um, we've been doing some work, you know, trying to get uh, media attention. Um, and it's interesting how difficult it is to convey a coherent thought. Um, how unable the consciousness seems to be to handle a complicated, integrated, deep, broad concept. Um, so, anybody know about how the hundredth monkey works? You hear about the hundredth monkey? Like we have to get a certain number of people to sort of grok this thought, and that's, yes, thank you. <laughs> and so by the act of doing that, by getting that concept into people's consciousness, we actually you know, hold space for the culture to comprehend what we're up to. Um, so as far as, as far as I'm concerned, um, that's my agenda here today, is to get your mind space wrapped around what we're up to and so that you can hold it and you can convey it and people who are, who are watching it later can convey it. Um, so yeah, there's gonna be lots of wonky details and tech speak that some of you people might get bored by, um, but you know, really getting into what we're up to and, and the sort of the, the broader uh, construct is, is our agenda is our agenda here um, so let me just lay that out for you in some in some you know broad detail and then the other speakers who are more specific and technical can 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 go deeper um, so as far as um, science is concerned uh, and um, so we are you know proposing to engage a deep and broad scientific research process to uh, verify empirically, you know, in a peer reviewable type manner, um, what a lot of us here, I think, intuit. Um, so, you know, talking about science, talking about agriculture, uh, a lot of the university system um, has been engaging in what I would call reductionist science. Um, I think if you track it back philosophically, it goes to Descartes um, and sort of um, the um, the, the sum can be understood through its parts. This idea that you can take things apart into the components, and if you understand the components, you can put them back together and understand the, the total, um, which might be fine for a piece of plastic or um, you know, a tractor, uh, but when you try to take life apart, take a, take a living cell apart and understand all of its component parts, right, all the co compounds, all the elements, you can't put them back together and have life anymore. Right, life is actually something much more. And so um, when we talk about agricultural science and human health and all the, so the things that are, that, are, that are integrated here are part of this um, understanding, 
uh, we need to engage science in a different manner. Um, most of agronomic science has been, okay, we're going to use less calcium and see what happens. We're going to have you know more temperature and see what happens. We're going to have more carbon dioxide and see what happens. We're going to it's called single factor analysis. We're going to change one metric, and we're going to monitor that metric and see the effects. And so most of the recommendations that are put forth to farmers are predicated on science that's been done in this manner, which is really outside of life. Um, I call it test tube science. You know, um, you know pH. I, anybody who's taken my workshops has heard my sort of commentary on pH and you know, why people think pH is so important and you manage soil for pH um, because of mineral availability in a test tube, right? The whole thing is about what works in a test tube and there's no life in a test tube. There's no mycorrhizae in a test tube. There's no, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we really need to frame how we're doing research um, in a different manner. So we're proposing here a, um, a multi-factor analysis model. Um, um, I like to think of it as, or refer to it as, um, epidemiological style of, an, of science. Let's look at multiple factors simultaneously and see where the patterns are, see where the connections are, et cetera. So um, Dorn and Mike are going to talk about uh, PharmOS uh, coming up next, um, which is a beautiful and powerful open data platform, um, which uh, we envision being able to be used by farmers, gardeners, researchers globally um, to monitor soil type, fertility program, management practice, epigenetics, cultivars, um, I say microbiome, um, climactic conditions, um, yield, pest and disease resistance. There are so many factors that go into how a plant grows and um, you know what its effect is on the landscape and how it performs. Um, and until we can actually monitor all these components simultaneously, we can't really tease out what are your limiting factors. Um, you know, farmers, gardeners, you know, in many cases feel overwhelmed by, you know, what should I do? How can I do a better job? And most of the recommendations uh, come from people trying to sell them things. Um, and that's really actually the people that are behind the scientific research are people that are, you know, have companies that are trying to sell products. Um, our understanding is that life does, has done a really good job for a really long time without many things being brought in in bags and buckets, right? Um, and in many cases, it's our limited perspective, our limited understanding, which is causing the problems in the first place. And so the idea here is that if we can overtly track and monitor multiple metrics simultaneously, we can begin to tease out what are your limiting factors on your farm, and we can give you guidance globally. Um, I like to say that the constituency that I'm committed to um, through the BFA is the global smallholder. Um, the hundreds of millions of people globally um, who are living on very small amounts of land and are you know, providing for their families, um, those are the people that I think you know, are, are true, those ones we are responsible for. You know, being from North America, um, being a white man, you know, I can easily get lost in sort of my privilege and my perspective, but luckily I have traveled enough um, to have compassion for for that, you know, the, the much more broad global perspective. And I think those are our allies. Those are the people we need to be working for. And the more guidance that we can give them, the more we can support people with best practices, um, the more we can systemically empower, uh, you know, a real systemic global transformation. So uh, we understand that plants, when grown well, sequester carbon, right? We understand that plants are green, because they've got chloroplasts in their leaves that they use to make sugar and oxygen. They put the oxygen into the atmosphere. They put the sugar into the soil. That's carbon dioxide converted into sugar, injected into the soil, is functionally a process of carbon sequestration. We believe, we understand that through agriculture practiced well, we have the capacity to systemically reverse climate change, right? To systemically sequester the carbon necessary to revitalize this planet. There are large portions of this planet which are brown now, which used to be green. Um, and we have the capacity through science, through technology, through communication, through collaboration to really rapidly reverse that. Um, so um, that's one piece of the puzzle is deeply revitalizing ecosystems. Uh, we believe we can do that through agriculture practiced well. Um, you know, the other end of the, of the spectrum is human health. Um, we understand 
that you know through USDA data, the nutrient levels in crops um, have been dropping dramatically since they've been monitored. Right, the average nutrient levels in carrots, in cucumbers, in beef, in milk, in eggs are much lower than they were 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and those nutrients are actually used by our bodies to function. Um, we understand, you know, Richard's going to be talking about this wherever he is. Um, <laughs> the critical role of minerals in enzyme systems, in DNA, in you know, degenerative disease. Uh, we have epidemic levels of degenerative disease present now planet-wide, um, in large part, we think, because of the fact that our food simply does not have the nutrients in it that our bodies need to function. Um, so all the way from reversing climate change to reversing degenerative disease, we think that through open collaborative data collection um, and discernment, through multi-factor analysis, through algorithms, through all this fancy tech speak, collaboratively, globally, we have the ability to, to um, really transform things quite rapidly. So. We'll get to the human health side in a few years. Uh, right now, that's a bit touchy. Anybody know about claiming to heal people? Bad, bad, bad move, <laughs> right? Real dangerous. So we're not going to really touch that right now. We're just going to focus on the soil and you know agriculture and, and the ecosystem. But really, I think if we understand what we're up to, we can see how this all beautifully ties together. Um, so uh, that's one piece of the puzzle is this open open collaborative um, data collection, um, and there's some really impressive partners we've got um, you know, coming together around this. It's really very exciting, and I'll, I'll let Doran and Mike talk about that in more detail. Um, the second half, the piece that I think has been used to entice you here, um, getting people's interest, is this idea of a little handheld gizmo, the spectrometer. Um, that's where it connects with the nutrient levels for humans and flavor and aroma. Um, in the same way that we have the ability to do open data collection in a way that's not proprietary, I didn't talk about that exactly, but the concept here is that all this information is in the commons, right? This is in the global commons. This is not proprietary. It doesn't belong to a company. Um, it can't, it's not being done to be profited off of. It's being done to, to empower. So in the same way we're working with open data um, and broad data, uh, we're envisioning uh, working with open hardware. Um, there's no reason that technology, that tools, that gizmos need to be controlled. There's no reason that all the algorithms need to be black boxed. Um, you know, if we actually understand the, the potential of using technology, we can't, I mean, I am, I think, relatively famous as a Luddite. Um, people who know me well know <laughs> I'm not a big fan of tools and technology and gizmos. Um, you know, but uh, we have to understand the potential um, and the fact that this is where culture is now. This is where consciousness is now. People have screens. Um, people have tools. They don't necessarily understand them. Um, their data is being collected. It's being utilized for purposes that are not necessarily in their interest. Um, um, it's not that the tools are bad. It's just that who's running them has interests that aren't necessarily in the collective well-being. So, um, so the idea here is basically that if we give consumers and not just consumers, but anybody in the supply chain, the ability to discern reality in real time, empirically, scientifically, what relatively how good is this carrot, relatively how good is that carrot, um, we can use economic self-interest, um, which seems to be a major driver in today's world, to shift the dynamics um, that are you know, present broadly. So a number of you have heard me talk about this in the past. Um, I don't need to belabor the point. Um, but the concept is here basically that if we understand we the people, we people who eat food, who care about our children, who understand physiologically that we are falling apart, that our children have diseases that they really shouldn't have, if we understand that there's a variation in nutrient levels in our food that correlates with flavor, that correlates with health giving attribute, that correlates with carbon sequestration, that correlates with ecosystem function, and if we can choose which crops to purchase, which food to purchase based on its inherent nutritional value, not based on the label, not based on the marketing, not based on any other sort of you know, surface facade, but on its actual inherent value, um, then we can use our economic power, which is our dollar, to inspire the supply chain to focus on doing a better job. Um, I, I have recounted oftentimes the story of my... Um, communication with somebody at Whole Foods who was relatively high up in the supply chain um, there and told him about this vision of a handheld spectrometer that could be used to 
um, test quality, and they said, you know, not a chance in hell we're going to work with you on this. Um, uh, <laughs> however, uh, when you're two years out from having one, please come tell us, and we will give our growers two years to meet standard. Um, I don't know how many years ago that was. It was probably at least five or six years ago. Um, you know, I, I think I can fairly confidently say we are now at that point. We are at a point now where two years from now, we will have a tool that a consumer can use to test quality at point of purchase. And so um, as I see the sort of the food industry, um, you know, they're sort of trying to figure out where consumers are at. Consumers are, are you know, understand that food doesn't have what they need. They're looking at different labels. They're trying different diets. They're trying to figure out what exactly it is that they're looking for and how to get it. Um, and we propose that it's actually the inherent nutritional value of the food that the consumers are looking for. And we propose to collaborate overtly, openly, with anybody in industry who wants to help produce that. Right? Our objective is not to embarrass anyone. Our objective is not to say, you're doing a bad job. Our objective is to say, here, we are moving forward in this strategy of openness and transparency and empiricism. Um, and consumers are going to be able to tell in the near future relatively how good the stuff is that's got your label on it. We would love to work with you between now and then to make sure that when they can test it, it is as good as possible. Um, so, you know, I think it's a $7.7 .7 trillion global annual, you know, industry food, which is not, you know, as big as defense maybe, but um, $7.7 .7 trillion still counts as money. Um, um, we think that if we can work overtly, openly, and collaboratively with with the food supply chain broadly, uh, with from the farmers to the consumers and everybody in the middle, to say, hey guys, we're all in this together. Um, you want to get good marketing because you're actually functionally sequestering carbon? Great, we'll help you document that, and you can market that that you that your farmers are sequestering carbon. You want to market that your eggs have four thousand percent more beta carotene than the USDA average, great. We'll help you market that. We'll help you document that. Um, the idea here is that we don't necessarily need to be fighting each other. If we understand our allegiances and our you know, incentives, we can, strat we can facilitate a dynamic where we're collaborating. And so um, this is really the potential of the tool is sort of um, that we can look right through the label, we can look right through the marketing, and we can see what's actually going on. And if we can track that to the open data platform, um, we can really facilitate collaboration. Um, we don't want to say to farmers, you're doing a bad job. We want to say to farmers, here's how you can do a better job. We don't want to say to farmers, you have to buy this product. We want to say to farmers, here's the principles, here's your limiting factors, here's how you can work, work more well with nature to accomplish these results. So um, I think that's most of what I wanted to say. Um, um, I can certainly go on for hours, as many of you know, on all kinds of topics um, and probably keep you entertained for some of it. Um, but really broadly, um, this is a, an endeavor um, that we've been talking about that a lot of um, organizations and groups, uh, individuals, allies um, globally now, it's really quite exciting. We've really moved beyond North America um, to a global sort of uh, community, are coalescing around um, I do not want this to be a BFA project. I really want this to be a, a, a coalition, a collaborative endeavor. I do not want this to belong to anybody in particular. I want this to be structured in a way that is in the commons, and we certainly are going to hold space for that. Um, we welcome um, you know, collaboration, um, support. Um, you know, we're actually getting you know, chunks of money that are five and even now six figures, um, which is quite impressive <laughs> for us. Um, certainly we need more than that. Um, so, you know, anybody who, who wants to uh, engage, um, you know, if you've got a lab, if you've got a farm, if you've got an organization, um, if you've got, you know, wealthy relatives, um, build soil. Well, before that happens, when, when I go into the grocery store and I buy something that I know is going to be squash, mm -hmm. and I find that there's absolutely nothing in there but one, and then people start clamoring for all of the things that are nutritionally dense, and there's this big upheaval, and grocery store, you know, is it going to be bedlam? 
<laughs> um, you know, you'll, you'll hear from, you know, Greg and, and David where we stand right now with this process, which is we have a functioning tool which seems to work and, you know, we don't have enough data points to really categorically say X, Y, and Z, yes, no, and, and maybe. Um, all the science, you know, everything we've got says this is, you know, this is exactly where we're going. We don't have a definition of quality yet. We don't have a consumer tool yet. You know, we are, you know, if, if all things go well, we're two years out. If all things go well, we're two years out. Um, and so we're basically saying, you know, heads up, world, um, here we come. And so the idea is there's lots of time between now and then um, for improvements to occur. Um, you know, I've been traveling the country, um, the continent, giving courses for 10 years now. Um, with information that is decades old, right? This, there is no new information here about how nature works, about how life works, about what the principles are. We have organizations, grassroots organizations, we've got people online, we've got videos, we've got consultants, we've got companies. We have everything we need to implement transformation rapidly. All the pieces are already there on the table. Um, and um, anybody ever made decisions based on fear? <laughs> um, anybody ever, you know, pain, they have this whole thing about pain guiding you, you know, like there's the, you know, what the hell this works? Like, um, I say we can learn through love and we can learn through empowerment and inspiration um, and, and, you know, sort of the greater good. Uh, in fact, I think, better for worse, many people operate on sort of fear and, you know, moving away from threat, the, you know, um, fight or flight. And so, you know, the idea here is at some point somebody's got to call the game and say, um, it's really about quality. Um, here's a bunch of people, like a really broad-based network, saying, yes, this is where we're going. And there's no reason that we have to be fearful about it. You know, the knowledge is there, the data is there, the, the, the materials are there, the guidance is there, the science is there. Um, and actually, you know, we have brought presenters in here to the conference who can speak to what's going on globally on hundreds of thousands of acres, millions of acres. There actually are consultants, you know, companies working on millions of acres globally. I mean, probably more than that, tens of millions globally applying these principles, right? We know big, big ag companies are applying these principles simply because it's better business. Um, when you have less fungal pressure on your strawberries, um, they have a better shelf life and um, they taste better. Um, you make more money. Um, we've got really big multinational, multi-billion dollar companies applying these principles already. So it's not like everything's junk. Um, there is a continuum, and that's all it's about is a continuum. It's not about you're good and you're bad. It's you're at 20% and you're at 40%. You're at 16% and you're at 80%. And, and you know, we hope that through this process, we move everybody upward. Um, and there's a, there's a, it's, a, it's an incentive. It's a collaboration. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I mean, who knows what's going what's gonna to occur? Mark? Yeah, Dan, I also, it's a question, maybe a comment. Anyone that gardens in here? anyone that grows food in really rich soil, uh, I view as a healthcare hero. And I don't know what the name of the device is going to be, but I just thought of one, which is a healthcare hero finder. <laughs> Way too long. Right? Yes. I mean, if you think about this, because yeah. at the point of purchase, I'm going to know how you farmed. And it's not going to be a value based on what someone tried to convince me was the reason why I should buy it, because yeah. of the way it looked. So I guess my question is, is the device, do you think, is it going to allow us as consumers to make a better decision around who are the healthcare heroes? Who is farming in a way that is restorative and in, in service to life? Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, <laughs> that's the intention. And what we call it is a good, fat question. Um, you know, I mean, what we call all this stuff, we've been really good so far about not having any names or any labels or any isms. Right. And that's part of why we don't have much traction in the broader communities because we have successfully avoided being pinned down. Right. I call it life. Right. Um, I think it's life that we're dealing with, and it, that's the paradigm. It's not this reductionist mechanistic paradigm. It's, a, it's, it's life is the paradigm. And so, um, yeah, 
And I think there's all kinds of wonderful positive messaging that can go along with this. I mean, there's so many wonderful stories we can be telling. Um, it's yeah, it feels really inspiring. Maybe one last question. What's that? Honoring the circles of life. Honoring the circles of life. Yeah, we can go on for. <laughs> yeah. I think the bigger, the greater value of what you're saying is not it's not this is a tool that farmers can use because a lot of people, I mean, from the market, people will look at the food and with this meter and say, well, this isn't up to par. But it doesn't mean that the farmer is not doing everything right. Before he even gets there, this is a tool that can help the farmer to see what is lacking well, in the you. soil. I didn't make that those, point. Well, well you did. Well, I know. I, I, you're, the point you're making is what I wanted to emphasize, which is that this is, I said, all the way from the farmer to the consumer. But the real point is the more we know, you know, overtly, empirically, categorically, multifactorially, you know, whatever, um, about what the causal dynamics are, the more we can support the farmers from doing a better job. And my understanding is that, you know, literally we'll be able to flash a light at the leaf. And the more you know about the environmental conditions, the more we'll be able to say to the farmer, you need two grams of cobalt per acre. As a foliar spray, it'll be, you know, the core of the B12 molecule, which will, you know, facilitate all these biochemical pathways, which will give you the pest resistance, which will obviate the need for the insecticides, which will increase the nutritional value, which will sequester more carbon. You know, we should, I mean, my understanding is we can technically do this. We can technically go out to the field, flash light at the leaf, based on a few other data points, give the farmers the ability to, for 50 cents an acre, transform overall system function because we know exactly what it is that's, that's missing. In real time. In real time. Yeah. And so, you know, I see the ability to do this, to facilitate this as, as really quantum, you know, beyond our ideas about how long things take. Um, really, I think we're at this point now within culture, um, with social media and all this kind of stuff, um, where once the consciousness gets focused on something, um, the transformation happens extremely rapidly. So, yeah, absolutely. As a farmer, you know, I can tell you my objective is not to embarrass farmers. My objective is not to put them down. Uh, my objective is to empower farmers um, to make a better living, to have a better quality of life. You know, how many farmers are applying toxins to the land that really, really, really don't want to? How many farmers are living in an environment where there's no clean water and where children in their school are dying from diseases that they know in their heart of hearts have to do with the way they're treating the land, right? Farmers do not want to be doing a lot of the things that they're doing, and they need the support and the guidance and the empowerment that comes from collaborative, this, you know, this other reality, not from their salespeople and the universities, sorry to say. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we have the opportunity here to be really deeply um, empowering, and that's, that's basically the vision here. Richard? Yeah, Dan, first it's laughed at, like when I read the Time Magazine article and I called you up and I said, you made me laugh today, you're in there and you don't even have anything produced yet. <laughs> and then it's <laughs> going to be heavily criticized. Really kind of yeah, yeah. The hardest part is going to be get past the criticism because you're going to have uh, other people that are going to want to shoot this into the ground about as fast as an old horse needs to become into glue. Mm -hmm. Once you get past the criticism stage, then it becomes accepted. Once it's accepted, the markets will then be driven by where the dollar's flowing and everything will start to fall into place. Yeah. But the hard is yet to come is getting this accepted uh, in terms of everyday knowledge, not just a machine, because you're going to find a lot of people that will do experiments that will be rigged uh, where the money lies mm -hmm. as to perpetrate this is not a reality thing. Yeah. Sit back, be quiet, and take your fluoride. Yeah, well, um, take the what? The fluoride? Your fluoride pills. Your fluoride. Oh, take your fluoride. Um, yeah. Uh, um, good things aren't always easy. Um, the strategy here is that we're doing everything in the commons, um, that it's all open, um, and we are looking for you know guidance and buy-in from thoughtful people. Um, I think there's enough skepticism at this point in the broader culture of mass media, of, you know, industry forces, of, you know, hacks, whatever you want to call them. Um, and there's enough, there are enough, you know, real grassroots people, thoughtful people that have honor um, that if we can coalesce, if we the people can coalesce around an endeavor like this, and it's like, my God, look at all these people who are all saying this is a good idea. 
That's the only way we, that's, that's, that's how we inoculate ourselves. We inoculate ourselves by coming together, by coalescing, um, by telling this different story. Um, you know, I was talking to Joel Salton last winter about this. You know, he said, I was part of this project with Mother Earth News did, where they tested eggs from 10 different farms that were uh, doing grass-fed pastured poultry, and, and they, you know, ran the full nutritional profiles on them, and they published them against, you know, this is, this is what's in our grass-fed eggs, and this is what the USDA average says about what's in eggs. And there was a 4,000% variation in beta-carotene, 4,000%. And I think people don't, they, they think that, you know, that the carrots have so much potassium and so much, you know, sodium and so much, you know, phosphorus, and that's just not true. So there are a bunch of big thought forms that we can get out there in front of. Um, we can do the data collection. We can, we, can, we can start to propagate this information out there. It's not all going to happen all at once. It's not all going to happen all at once. And we sort of say these are the first, second, third, fourth, fifth steps. And that's really what I want to transition this conversation to is where are we at, where are we going, um, what do we need, um, and really engage people's critique and suggestions. This is really a collaborative process. I think I've framed it out well enough now uh, for the time being. So, um, yeah. All right. And I've only used up five more minutes than I'm supposed to. <laughs> There's five more questions. <laughs> um, I, w I want to move on now to Dorn and Mike um, and PharmaOS. Um, there's certainly going to be time this afternoon for people to offer comments and critique and suggestions and insight. Um, not everybody's going to get a chance to talk um, in this space. Uh, we are going to be capturing everybody's thoughts. And the real idea here is that we had this event at the beginning of the conference so that we can buzz about it for the next three days, right? This is the idea, is that we're building a buzz. We're building momentum. We're building passion and creativity and coherence. And all these conversations, all these thoughts can percolate and vibrate and, you know, um,